All right, welcome back to Computer Science 164. This is lecture two. So today we dive a bit more into MVC as well as into database design. And we'll look in particular at Project Zero and courses.xml, with which hopefully you have struggled a little bit. And we will see through a series of Q&A if you can show off with your brilliant designs or if there's still an opportunity before Friday to tweak or improve upon based on what some of your classmates say here. So just a heads up that lab tomorrow Tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday um, will be same time, same place. Uh, this is in uh, Pierce 301, schedules on the website. And this week's focus will be some more advanced techniques with Git, particularly ones that will help you work with a partner uh, without colliding with each other's changes of code. And then uh, also looking at databases and the M in MVC for model. So MVC, what was this all about? What was the point of introducing this construct in the first place? What do you got? Yes, Carl. Logic for each particular okay, good. So having separate logic for each component, so to speak, of your application, so that you can change one, uh, each one individually. What else motivated this notion of MVC as opposed to just writing raw PHP like you might have done in fifty? Yeah, so particularly separate presentation from logic. So the C is controller, the V is view, and those are meant to conjure up the idea that those two can and probably should be separate for any number of reasons. What, what, why should your views, why should your data be kept separate from the actual logic of your program? Yeah. So you can render different views on different platforms? Yeah, perfect. So you can render different views. If you want to have a mobile view, you want to have a desktop view, you want to have an iPad specific view, it's just so much easier if you only have to change code in one place. Moreover, all you have to change is the fluffy aesthetic code, and you don't actually have to change any of your database queries, any of your controller code, so to speak. It makes it much easier to uh, alter just parts of your system. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so you can also isolate front-end code from back-end code. And by front-end, we generally mean HTML, CSS, JavaScript, this kind of stuff. And back-end would be your MySQL calls or your raw XML files, anything that doesn't need to be web accessible. And indeed, that's why we introduced this whole notion of vhost. So back in uh, the day when you first learned to make websites, you probably used public HTML. And the downside of using public HTML is that typically you just throw everything in there. And you rely on security through obscurity. You sort of cross your fingers that no one knows you have an includes directory inside of which is a config.php file or something similar. And why? What's the concern about keeping something like config.php or the like inside public HTML? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. It's going to have sense of information, probably a database username and password, maybe some uh, uh, API key from some third party website. And in short, if something goes wrong with your website, you screw up the open bracket question mark tag, or you mess up the configura of your configuration of your web server like we did last week, it's relatively easy to accidentally just expose your raw code so that the PHP interpreter does not actually execute that code. Rather, the web server just spits it out. So you want to not trust yourself. And so thus, what did we introduce much more of a direct structure and vhosts help us create the illusion that all of that stuff lives in the root of a web server. So this painted the picture of MVC and we focused last week on controller and view. We didn't really have a model because I pretty much just hard coded the links that I wanted to have for each lecture and for each video and for the syllabus right into my views. But today we can improve upon that a little bit and take advantage of some of CodeIgniter's features that facilitates this. So you'll probably or hopefully have mixed feelings by the end of a week or two from now with CodeIgniter on the one hand. And hopefully it does actually simplify some things and allows you to whip up um, fairly quickly the skeleton of a website. But hopefully over time, if not immediately, you'll get frustrated perhaps with some of the design decisions that the authors of this framework made. And I think you'll find this in general. There's, my God, there's so many PHP, in particular, frameworks out there of varying degrees of quality. CodeIgniter's upside is that it's actually relatively simple. It's a nice, gentle introduction to MVC. But hopefully as you get more comfortable or more sophisticated with your designs, you'll start to be frustrated um, by the fact that you're now relying on this framework. Um, and we'll see similar tensions perhaps with Xcode when you pretty much have to code in accordance with the APIs Apple has given you. 
So this is just the fluffy picture that Codeigniter presents that really does kind of depict the whole workflow. So if you had trouble wrapping your mind around what happened, really you can think of it in these terms, whereby index.php was, recall, the, the main controller for all of Codeigniter. It was the only thing last week that was in the HTML directory. Everything else was in a directory called <laughs> system or application, and we'll see that again in a bit. And that's totally Codeigniter specific. This isn't some fundamental web concept, it's just their particular design. But what's interesting about Code Igniter is when our HTTP request, whether GET or POST or something else, comes into that index.php file, there's logic in there and in related files that figures out how to route that request to the appropriate controller. And the simplest way that Code Igniter does this is just by looking at the URL itself. So this is a canonical. Uh, excerpt from their own documentation, whereby if your website is example.com and the user visits slash foo, slash bar, slash baz, foo, bar, and baz are interpreted to be each of these placeholders here. So slash foo means go find the foo.php controller that I created, specifically call the bar method inside of the foo class, and then pass into that bar method the arguments that I've passed along the end there. So if we made this a little more real, if we had something like, let me do this on a separate line. So if it were example.com slash lectures, because I want the lectures controller to see all of the lectures for a course. But you know what? I specifically want a specific lecture. So I might further refine it like that. And the lecture I want is two. A URL like this could be automatically resolved by Codeigniter or any similar framework to invoke the lectures controller, the lecture method within. And it's going to pass in an argument of literally the number two. So none of this was, all of this was possible when you only had HTTP gets and posts, and we typically used ampersands and question marks to pass in HTTP parameters. But there's definitely a trend these days toward uh, prettier URLs, things that just have slashes and tokens in them and not question marks, ampersands, and the like. And just to remind why, what was one of the values of having slightly sexier URLs like this than things with lots of question marks, ampersands, and equal signs? Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the biggies, just search engines. Because a typical search engine like Google, if it sees a URL that has a question mark and a whole bunch of parameters, typically it's going to ignore those parameters, at least in terms of the listings that you put in a search engine, because they're assumed to be dynamically generated. And if you individually indexed every page on the internet that took HTTP parameters, you would just mushroom the number of uh, web pages there. So this is a way of sort of telling forcibly the internet that you actually do care that there is content specifically at this destination. So it turns out, though, that this doesn't just work so easily right out of the box. So let me go into the appliance. And this was the example from last time. So this is the very last one we did, which was example eight. And in example eight, we had our little home page here with lectures and syllabus. And if I go ahead and click on lectures, I then notice the URL changes to be slash lecture. If I click lecture zero, notice the URL changes. Not quite as I just promised. We're actually going to clean this up a little bit. But notice that, whoops, notice that the, lec the URL right now is slash lecture slash zero. And all of the other directories, of course, are just for lecture's sake. Um, in a normal website, we would probably get rid of MVC and 8 and HTML. So it turns out that what you're really seeing here, let me go back to the first page here slash HTML index.php slash lectures. And there's actually a non-trivial number of student groups on campus that run like MediaWiki installations, which is like Wikipedia software or WordPress installations, where you see, frankly, these horrific looking URLs, where you see index.php in all of the URLs, and then some stuff after it. So what's actually going on here? So this is actually a web server trick. One of the nice things about web servers today, and the fact that we run one on the appliance, is you have very low level control over how requests are handled. <laughs> and so this is actually the reference, this is actually the URL of a file. Index.php was that controller that we talked about earlier. But take a look at what's actually been inside of that directory. And from lab uh, one and also from the project, you might have seen this already. If I do ls, all right, I just see my usual files. But if I do dash al, I see everything. And inside of this is htaccess. So this is an Apache convention. Apache being one of the most popular web server software out there. Uh, this one specifically for Linux. And in here, is this little trick. 
So this is an example of taking,、uh, this is an example of a fairly complex、um, but powerful feature of Apache where you can rewrite things as much as you want. This is a means by which you can hide the PHP extension on all of your files, which these days looks a little ugly. If you see .php, .html, you can hide all of that by, so to speak, rewriting things. So from top to bottom, it's fairly straightforward. The top line just means turn this feature on. The second line is necessary only for lecture's sake in that we have Um, we're not using the base URL of the website, but rather we are using、um, slash mvc, slash eight, slash html. But what do you think the third line is saying? It's a condition, so it's sort of a weird way of writing an if else. Go back to sort of the basics. Like they're just stealing syntax that we've used in other languages. So, exclamation point. Not our index.php, index.php. The backslash is probably there because escape just escape it, right? Otherwise, it would be any character, a wild card. Dollar sign one is actually you wouldn't really know this、uh, necessarily, and it's a little weird.、Uh, we don't have a pointer here just yet. So the dollar sign one is referring, sort of forward thinking wise, to whatever is going to be matched in parentheses on the next line. So by next line, I mean. That's okay. I'll find one later.、Um, so the next line is saying, "All right, go ahead and match everything after the slash in the original URL, and store it in a temporary variable, dollar sign one by default." And it's the parentheses that do this. If you know PHP and you've used preg match before, you have the same notion of capturing parentheses. And what it's saying is, if so long as the file that was requested is not Bang index.php, go ahead and pass this HTTP request along to in the fourth line that file index.php, but pass after it the slash file name that was actually originally requested. So in other words, if the user has not explicitly requested index.php, pretend that they have and append to the end of that file name whatever was in the original. URL. So what CodeIgniter is then capable of doing in its own index.php file, it has the ability through PHP Super Globals, if you recall, dollar sign underscore server and the like, to see what exactly was appended at the end of the file name that's in the URL that was requested, and it realizes, oh, that's slash foo slash bar slash baz. Let me now require once. Foo.php. Let me go ahead and call the bar method, and let me pass to the bar method the very last thing at the end of that URL. So that's all that's happening there, and it's not even strictly necessary. It's really ultimately just an aesthetic detail so that your URLs don't look like, for instance, this here. Yeah. On the third, correct. So on the third line, it's actually not a regular expression that we're using.、Um, the third line is literally map this to index.php. So it's only the third line that involves a regex. So this is worth drawing your attention to too, because right now we are saying that any request for a file. Other than index.php itself should get mapped to index.php. In other words, if I request slash foo slash bar slash baz, actually pass that to index.php slash foo slash bar slash baz. But what if the file the user is actually requesting is hello.jpg? Well, what's going to happen there? Well, a request for example.com slash hello.jpg is actually going to get resolved to example.com slash index.php slash hello.jpg. Bad, right? Because that's obviously not the actual graphic file. So among the things you'll have to bear in mind is as you design this and future sites, and you actually have assets like CSS and JavaScript and images, realize that this dark magic actually does need to be tweaked so that you're not routing absolutely everything. And if you look in CodeIgniter's documentation, there's more sophisticated ways of doing this, so you don't have to hard code every possible file that you want to whitelist. Uh, L just means last. So if you had other rewrite rules, this one would say stop executing here once it's matched. Another hand somewhere? Yeah. How do you handle like、um, more restful routes? More restful routes? In what sense here?、Um, in terms of like mapping the same thing, if it's like a get or a post or a request. Well, so in the, we'll talk about rest later this semester. But for those unfamiliar, it essentially means using URLs to identify resources on a server.、Um, I mean, this can be used in precisely the same way to represent REST endpoints, whereby your REST endpoint could just be a controller that this then maps a request to. 
But for, for like code now, do you have to do all through basically rewrite rules? Or is it like no, OK, no, I see where you're going. So short answer, no, and we'll see that in just a second. But for now, all this does is it gets rid of the ugliness of index.php, but it can certainly do much more. All right. so. <laughs> What was bad then about this design? So let me go into version 8 here and recall that we had a whole bunch of files and they're summarized here in the readme that accompanies each of these things. So we introduced last week CodeIgniter and CodeIgniter came with a whole bunch of default directories among which were application, uh, among which were syst was system, and among which was index.php. And then inside of those first, uh, those directories were actually other files. So it takes a little bit of time to acclimate to all the stuff that's in here. What we did with the readme files is pretty much do dot, dot, dot for anything that's not interesting to look at yet. Um, so realize that you can focus your attention only on these things. And in answer to, to your question, routes.php um, contains some of the magic with which we can do this mapping of URLs to actual methods. So let's take a look. This was the end result, recall. So we have the lectures page. I click lecture zero. And then I have these dynamically generated links to a PDF and to a video. So how did this actually work? Well, let me go back to the code. And let me go into last week's application directory. Let me go into my controllers directory. And we had just one file here. So there's two different controllers at play here. There's index.php, which came with the framework, and whose sole purpose in life is to route requests to controllers you actually wrote. So homepage.php is just an arbitrary name I came up with. It is in the controllers directory. And this is where I actually implemented the logic, the business logic of my program. So there's nothing aesthetic in here per se, but it does invoke the thing called the view. So how did I go about creating this controller? So the means by which CodeIgniter and a lot of these frameworks work is they give you some base classes. So recall object-oriented programming, where you can have a base class from which other things descend. And we'll come back to this before long. But for now, you can just take it, uh, just assume that you must start any such controller with class homepage extends CI underscore controller. Kind of a stupid name, but that just means you get a bunch of functionality for free. What is the functionality you get for free? Well, because you are extending the CI controller class, and by that I mean there is a class that the CodeIgniter folks made that is called CI controller. And just conceptually, what you're doing is you're saying, I am now going to implement a class that's called homepage that contains every one of the methods and every one of the data fields as this class. But I might want to add my own. And I also might want to override some of the things in the parent class. So among the features I get for free by extending that class <laughs> is this feature of index. So CodeIgniter assumes that if you implement a method called index, that is the method that's going to get invoked automatically if the URL visits a U if the user visits a URL of the form slash homepage with no bar or baz. So just the name of the controller. Index will get invoked. Meanwhile, if you visit slash uh, homepage slash lectures or homepage slash lecture, notice that I'm calling each of these methods instead. So what do each of these methods do? They're almost all identical. So they're definitely following a pattern here. But on the very first line of index, the very first thing I do, recall, is I invoke my header. So the header is a view. It's sort of a partial view. And recall, the header contained what? Like the fluffy stuff like open bracket HTML, body, head, and all of that stuff that we previously implemented manually ourselves. Um, the footer contained the boring stuff like the close body tag and the close uh, HTML tag. And then what is meant to be in this second view? Yeah? The actual relevant view for the exactly. and the rest of the template. So the minimal HTML that itself constitutes the index page, not the header, not the footer, but just the body of that page. Similarly for lectures, if you visit slash lectures, I want to see as before the header, I want to see as before the footer, but then in between those two chunks of HTML, I want to spe see specifically the view called homepage slash lectures. And then a similar story for the lecture method. But notice the one interesting difference about the lecture method is that it takes an argument. And when I kept saying slash foo slash bar slash baz before, dollar sign n represents which of those variables? 
So baz, right? The very last thing in this case in the URL, and it will be automatically passed in by CodeIgniter to this method. And then notice the interesting feature here is that my view in advance is not going to know what lecture I want. It would be kind of bad design if I had 13 or so different lecture pages that were all manually hard coded. Much better if I can have one and pass in dynamically an argument like n so that it can parameterize itself and display content for that. Particular lecture. So now notice these paths template slash header, home page slash index, template slash footer. If I actually get out of my controllers folder and go into views, there are those two subdirectories. Let's go into templates because it's the simplest of them thus far. And there's the header. This is code that we wrote. Ourselves early on. Notice that I'm echoing a title in two different places. I'm calling HTML special chars just in case we accidentally spit out something dangerous. But where is title defined? Where did that come from? I haven't actually, yeah. Yeah, so recall in the controller that you can pass in an associative array of variables. And in that associative array, in this case, was a variable called title. And how is that implemented? Well, if you think back to like version two or three from last week, you can implement this same idea of templates yourself. PHP has the extract function. So if you call extract on, a variable, on a, an associative array, it explodes that array so that all of the keys become actual variables, much like title in this view is an actual variable. And there's no mention anymore of the array that was passed in. Footer, meanwhile, just looks like this, completely uninteresting. So, lastly, in views, here's the home page folder of views. There's index, there's lecture, there's lectures, and these two are fairly trivial right now. That just has a hard coded link to lectures, one hard coded link to section. Lectures, meanwhile, just a hard coded list of all the lectures we'd have up until that point. And then, lastly, lecture, singular, is a little different in that I'm using n this time, but that's it. That's the only difference. Yeah. So I'm not super familiar with how PHP is going to scope, but there's, there's no other way to pass in like, instance variables from the array. Like, you can't extract it in the uh, control and then have those accessible to you. Uh, correct. You cannot call the extract function on the associative array in the controller method because those variables will be scoped only to that <laughs> function, not globally outside of it. And the view is effectively out. It's part of it conceptually, but programmatically, it's completely different. It's a separate PHP file. You are accessing that separate PHP file by way of a method that is called, in this case, this load view. So it's in its own separate namespace. So the only way to pass data or variables in is by way of an argument. Otherwise, it won't have access. Um, and in terms of rendering it different ways, If you want to respond in a different way. Sorry, like, I mean, one of the things you might want to be doing is you want to be pinging the server for you know, data back, right? So if you want to respond in, you know, if it's coming from a mobile app or something, respond as a JSON object. Okay. Um, how would you, like, OK, well, so I can guess what I think your question is. What you can probably do in this case is in, you can output code conditionally. So you could say the equivalent of in pseudocode if mobile device, then go ahead and do these three lines. Right. Otherwise, go ahead and do these other three lines, which might reference different views altogether. Alternatively, you could do the trick we talked about last week, where you actually move the user to a different domain, like m.example.com. And you just have a sim different set of files there. But you can still borrow code from both mobile and non-mobile versions. But typically, this is where you could do something like the user agent detection. If this is a mobile device, spit this out, else spit this out. What if like, render as, render as <coughs> JSON, render like a collection as something, how would you use something like that? So that's even easier. If what you want to spit out, as in the case of Ajax, which odds are you'll want to use for Project Zero, well, then you don't even spit out HTML. Rather, what you can simply do is something like this. If I get the data I want to return to user, you can do something effectively like JSON encode, though there's a CodeIgniter method for this, of the array in which all of my data is stored. And then this stuff goes away. And does the, does the routing engine automatically send in the format? 
It, that, no. So you would have to do that. So your AJAX call, where if you're presumably using jQuery, you would somehow send an HTTP parameter that either says, give me back JSON, as opposed to HTML, or you would simply have your AJAX query hit a URL whose sole purpose in life is to return JSON and never HTML. But that would be, it would have to be like a custom route, right, to do it with the format again. Oh, with the .json convention? Oh, uh, yes, you could do that in a few ways, but one of which would be you could do it in a custom route. Yeah, Lexi. Um, yeah, so, is it, so would you be returning the JSON string or just like echoing it in its own view? Ah, uh, returning the, that's a good question actually. If you were, um, <laughs> he's not there. I'm actually not sure. Well, so if you use the built-in JSON methods, it takes care of that for you. Um, if you simply echo it here, I think bad things will happen. Let me check on that. What's that? Because you're not really rendering it if you just do that. Well, I mean, that's, well, what do you mean by rendering? I guess you're not rendering it in its own view like a typical AJAX. No, no, you wouldn't need a separate view file at all. If you're just returning JSON, you don't need the um, cruft of HTML or any templates or anything like that. No. Yeah? You don't have to set an MIME type or anything like that, though? Set a MIME type? Um, you, well, if J, uh, J, Code Igniter would do that for you if you actually use their JSON encoding method as opposed to just doing it yourself. If you did do it yourself, like um, you might have before a framework like this, yes, then you would say something like before echoing this, you would say header content type application JSON or text JavaScript <coughs> or similar so that the browser knows. Most browsers are fairly resilient, but that would be best practice. Yeah? Is it better style to parse a template or render a view? Do you know? <laughs> to parse a template or render a view, what do you, how do you distinguish the two? Uh, so Code Igniter has its own set of, um, I mean, a, a parse, a template class, mm -hmm. a parser class, um, and then rather than using uh, just variables that come out of seemingly thin air, then you, you um, have placeholders for them? Oh, so the advantage there is um, performance potentially, because things can be cached more effectively. Um, so that. Yeah, so that's typically the advantage there. And we'll also talk maybe later in the term about JavaScript templates uh, engines that can do something similar for performance client side. Yeah, and back. Is there like some standard design practice on how to choose how many controllers a website has? Like if you had like a lecture page, should you make a separate controller for that? Ah, so that's a good, a good question and perfect segue actually. So there's actually some shortcomings with this design right now. And if I wanted to, for instance, let me transition to the lecture two directory for today and go into version nine and go into application controllers again. This is almost identical. I started by copying and pasting version eight that we just looked at. So if I wanted to introduce the notion of not just lectures but also labs, the natural next step for me would be to use my existing home page controller and simply add a labs method and a lab method. And then suppose we had review sessions or sections. Well, you can imagine just adding more and more methods to this particular controller, but things start to get a little messy at that point, right? And Conceptually, once we have all these different types of classes which have different types of resources, like labs don't have videos but lectures do have videos, we might want to functionally display the data in a different <laughs> way. And so at that point, you might very well want to introduce a lectures controller that handles all things related to lectures and a labs controller that does the same for labs. And so that actually, and that'll be version 10 here, would be probably the best design, certainly as things start to scale. So generally you would come up with a controller for any sort of function, distinct functionality that you want your application to provide. And maybe it's themed around real world entities like lectures or sections. Maybe it's themed around data like courses or departments uh, or lists in the case of Project Zero. It's really up to you to draw those lines. So how was this routing actually happening? Well, let me go into briefly my config directory, and you might recall from lab or from section if you, or from um, project zero if you've started playing around that, actually let me go into routes here, uh, config routes.php. So notice that I actually have, let me go into version eight so that we don't see too much at once, the application, config, so this is a special <coughs> file in Code Igniter that lets you alter the behavior of URLs. And this is how in version eight and now nine, we were able to map a certain structure 
of a URL to a specific controller. So this is unfortunately CodeIgniter's own little syntax with parentheses and colons here. But what this says here, first of all, in reverse order, is that the default controller for CodeIgniter for version 8 of my application should be the home page controller. In other words, if I visit lecture1 slash uh, and that's it, or at least lecture one slash MVC slash uh, eight slash. So the base URL of this application, it should invoke the home page controller, right? And so that's nice because you can map it to something arbitrary. And for those of you who did attend lab or have played around, what is actually normally the default controller that you see when you just visit slash once you've just installed CodeIgniter? Yeah, so it's the welcome.php controller. So all I did was change that. In fact, I renamed welcome to home page just to give it a little more semantic meaning and mapped it that way. But more interesting is when you do things like this. So this was my way of teaching CodeIgniter that when you see slash lectures, you should actually map it to the controller called home page <coughs> and specifically the method called lectures, plural. And then lastly, up top, if instead CodeIgniter sees a URL of the form lecture slash something, anything, go ahead and map that to home page slash lectures slash dollar sign one. And just like in the case of a regular expression, that dollar sign one is referring to whatever any was representing right there. So this is a way of overriding, to be clear, this format here, which is the default. And in fact, this is going to get very messy if now in answer to your question, I just start copying and pasting my lectures method, my lecture method, and make a labs method and lab method. Anytime you, uh, you start feeling yourself copying and pasting in this way, you're probably doing something wrong. So let's go ahead and fix. So let me go into, for today's examples, all of whose code is available online, let me instead go into version 9, which is only different in as much as it has labs in addition to lectures. So in this case, my home page looks only trivially different with these three options. If I click lectures, I see a similar format to before, lecture zero, similar format as before, back, back, and now labs is the same. So there's definitely an opportunity now to refactor my code and do this a little more cleanly. Yeah? I'm sorry? What do you mean scope controllers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, case in point, my own controller is inheriting from this. So one of the ways we could tackle this, and we'll look more at inheritance in the next lecture, um, is we could actually make our own controller from which all of our others descend if you want to have some common functionality, if um, that's if, what you were hinting at. Rewrite methods in the CI, uh, CI controller. Mm -hmm. um, would you have to like, actually change that, or could you like, do some kind of, um, I don't know, PHP monkey fashion for it? Or would you just write your own home page Um, so if I followed correctly, if you want to override methods that were implemented here, you simply implement them yourself here with identical names. I'm saying, like, you'd have to have your own face thing that everything else inherits from, because everything already inherits from the CI controller. Ah, so short answer, no. No, you don't need any additional layer of hierarchy unless you find that you have this controller, this controller, this controller, this controller, and you find over time that, man, every one of these controllers has a foo method and a bar method. Let me factor those out by interposing in this family tree of controllers a middleman like that that has that base functionality. But again, we'll come back to this, this type of design next time. But that's definitely an option. All right, so let's clean this up, and we do that in version 10 here. So in version 10, we have a slightly different structure. And let me just open the readme, which already shows a little cheat sheet of the files in here. Almost all of this is the same, right? We've got our same templates at the bottom. We've got our home page up there. <laughs> and notice at the top, though, and I, uh, notice at the top under controllers, I've introduced a separate controller now, one called lectures and one called labs. So let me actually go in there and see what's different this time. So first, in application, in config, in routes, notice that I've cleaned up the mess that I was starting to make. And I call it a mess because if you have to hard code half a dozen, a dozen or more routes, there's got to be a cleaner way of doing this. And so sure, I'm going to go back to the original and I'm just going to rely on CodeIgniter's default mechanism of slash foo, slash bar, slash baz. So in my controllers now, notice I have a few controllers here. In welcome.php, I just use the same name this time rather than come up with an arbitrary homepage.php file. The only thing this welcome page does is it displays my main menu. So it displays a header, then the index, then the footer. So that's identical to what we had before. And those links include labs, lectures, and sections. So just to be clear, if I go into version 10 here, what we see is that. So that's all that's inside of that view called 
index.php. And just to be super sure on the same page, if I go into views and I go into welcome, index.php, that's all that's there. That's where that came from. All right, so the interesting part and the step forward this time is that now I have a lectures controller. And this is much closer to a good solution now to this problem. So class lectures extends CI controller. Why do you need that? It's just so that the whole system works together. Among uh, whose features will be, index will get called automatically for us. So in the index method, notice we're doing the same thing as before. But this time, I'm opening the lectures slash index file as the contents of this page. And then notice I ditched the lectures method. I decided this was a little sloppy, and so I'm going to tweak my URL scheme a little bit now to be consistent with CodeIgniter's defaults. And my function called lectures will still take a argument n so that we can pass it in to that template in this way. And again, just to make clear that there's really no magic here, in the index page, that's all that's there. It's still hard coded, so there's still a little more room for improvement, certainly, in that I don't want to be hard coding all this HTML every week. But if I now go into the lecture page, notice it is fairly like what it was before. So ugly URL, but it's just mapping to deterministically predictable URLs on our CDN server. Echo N is dynamically spitting out the number of the lecture so we can get the right PDF and video. All right, so in the end, what does this version look like? Well, if I go to lectures, Notice the URL at the moment is, let's call it slash, because this is just messiness as the result of having so many examples in one lecture. So let's click lectures. Notice it changes to lectures. And now notice with lecture zero, it changes to be a little longer than before. We had slightly shorter URLs, but now it's a little clear that foobar and baz in this case are the lectures controller, the lecture method therein, and zero is just an argument that's passed in. Any questions? All right, so what are we? Yep. Yeah, so if your website's really big, you have a lot of links hard coded in your HTML templates, right? Is there a way to abstract that out and tell CodeIgniter to generate that URL from your controller? Indeed. So that if you actually look at CodeIgniter's helpers class in its documentation, there's a number of methods related to URLs, one of which will give you the base URL of the whole project. But realize it was deliberate that I hard coded the CDN links because those are on a different server altogether. All of my other links were actually relative, so it should be pretty portable. Other questions? Yeah? What happens if your method takes more than one argument? Good question. So the CodeIgniter folks have decided it would just be slash 0, slash x, slash y, slash z. You separate them by um, slashes. So you see this a lot, frankly, in blogging software and whatnot. When you have slash year, slash month, slash date, it's the same idea that they're leveraging. Yeah? These are always for gets, right? These are for gets or could be for posts. They will be routed to the same controllers. Yeah? So absolutely, we could really, s you mean something like this? Well, no, the, the, ask the question, like, what happens if you have more arguments? You said they would just keep being appended as more. You could do something like that, yeah. But could you, if I, want, if I had x, y, and z arguments, but I just have it show up as slash zero, do you have to have all those slashes after? Oh, um, no. So if you route it properly, right, if, right. You, if x, y, and z are optional, then no. You would not need just ugly placeholders there just because. Okay. This, at this point, things get a little messy, though, to be honest. And what folks will typically do then is start to resort to traditional get or post parameters that would actually um, not just have this arbitrary slash convention. Yeah? If you use it, uh, short answer, yes, because index.php, which is CodeIgniter's main controller, will receive that request irrespective of it being get or post, and it will still route it accordingly, and it will pass it the contents of get or post. <laughs> All right, so the biggest gap here is that really I have been using CP all the time to make each of these demos. And every week that there's a new lecture, I've got to go into these HTML files, the various views, and add yet another link and yet another link. So there's already an opportunity here to factor out that hard coding, actually use the M in MVC like a database. So let me propose that I'm going to go ahead and open up, let's say, a localhost slash PHP myadmin. Inside of the appliance, I'll log in as jharvard, password crimson, 
And in advance, I actually went ahead and created this Har J Harvard Lecture 2 database. As an aside, as the online documentation says, any databases J Harvard makes have to be called J Harvard underscore something for access rights. Um, and I'm going to propose, just to keep it super simple, a lecture is going to be a table that looks like this. All right, it's got an ID, which uniquely identifies it. It's just going to be an integer. And it's got a name, which might very boringly be lecture 1, lecture 2. But in theory, it could be lecture 1 colon HTML5 or something to that effect. So we have that duality. And then under labs, we have the exact same idea where we have an ID and a name. And what I went ahead and did is pre-populate this just so we have a working demo where labs has a lab 1 and lab 2. And lectures, if I clicked over, has the same thing. So in short, our data is now in a database, not in an HTML file. So how do we go about implementing the M in MVC? And how does this all sort of transcend CodeIgniter itself? So here is version. 11, and the last version of these very underwhelming course website de demos. So notice, I, for reference, I included a MySQL directory. Totally arbitrary. This is not functionally related to CodeIgniter. But what I did so that if you want to play around at home, I did a export or a MySQL dump of the database we just looked at in PHP MyAdmin. So it's in there. So if you've never seen these before, it just looks like a whole bunch of SQL queries, along with some fancy SQL queries related to collation types and so forth. But it's the white and yellow text that's mostly of interest there. So all that does is create the structure that I had there. And for those unfamiliar, how do you import a SQL database into something like PHP MyAdmin? You can use the import tab. right? You probably used that before, um, or at least the export tab. Or you can sort of do it the real way, whereby there is a MySQL command line client called MySQL. And this is available on most any system that has a MySQL database. The usage is typically dash u for the username, like J Harvard. Uh, dash p means I will have a password for you. <laughs> it's best not to put it here, because otherwise, why would you not put it there? So it gets logged in my history. And in fact, if you have nosy neighbors on the same system who are running commands like PS for process list or any number of other commands that show you what everyone else on the system is doing, well, they could, in that split second of time that your command is running, they can see what password you are using. So never should you include passwords on the command line if anyone else has access to the system. And what database do I want to use? Well, I want to use the Lecture 2 database that I created in advance. And then if I want to uh, import the contents of that SQL file into this database. Well, it's going to wrap onto two lines here. So let me do this on a separate line. MySQL dash U, J Harvard dash P, J Harvard underscore lecture two, and then input redirection. So you might remember this from 50 or similar, but you have the ability, J Harvard lecture two dot SQL. This will run the command on the left, and it will pass it as standard input, the content on the right. And it will even prompt you, if you need to, for the password. It doesn't exist, because now I'm in the wrong directory. Then I could type crimson and hit Enter. And so we'll actually see the command line client in a bit when we look at um, more sophisticated problems that arise with SQL in particular um, called transactions and locks that help solve. All right, so here it is, the last example of a mobile, if underwhelming, course website, version 11. All right, so in application this time, there is still my same directories as before, but I've introduced a models directory. Let's assume that's a black box for the moment and just go into controllers. And in controllers now, let me open up lectures.php. And this now is what captures really the spirit of MVC, whereby thus far we've just had some logic and we've had views, but we haven't really done anything interesting like fetch some data and then prepare that data in some way and then pass the data to the view. The most we've done is pass in silly little strings like lecture one or the number n. But now, thanks to this notion of a model, we can, in my method here, call a method like get lectures. So this is a method that I've written. This is an embodiment of the M in MVC. And apparently, this get lectures method is inside of a class called lecture. And I can access that class, apparently, by way of this. So for those unfamiliar, and we'll spend more time on this in the future in both PHP and JavaScript, this just refers to what again? the current object. So right now, we're inside of an object, specifically a lectures object. Notice that in the line prior, I'm telling CodeIgniter, hey, load the model called lecture. 
And that is just referring to a file we'll see in a moment called lecture.php, uh, capital L. And the next line, what CodeIgniter does when you call load model, quote unquote, something, it then makes that model accessible to you via that syntax, this arrow and then the model name. So you might imagine this can very quickly start to cause collisions um, with other names and other features of CodeIgniter. Yes. So this is one of the downsides of most any framework. They made a design decision here whereby hopefully CodeIgniter itself has no special functionality related to lectures because we would collide in this case. But it's fairly syntactically uh, friendly. Yeah? So is lecture here, is that using uh, active record or whatever Sort of. So we'll, we'll talk about active record and some other paradigms um, before long. It's, it's kind of a uh, bastardization of active record, whereby it kind of does that. Um, but it's not as clean as Ruby does or as some other frameworks actually do with active record. So we'll come back to this. Active record essentially means using a PHP class that maps directly to a row in a database so that any changes you make to the object are then reflected in the database. So we'll see that before long. So it's similar. And if you actually Google around, uh, search around on CodeIgniter's documentation, you'll see how they qualify it as sort of active record. And they actually have an active record class that's a little more similar. Right, but the, this doesn't extend that extensively to the default class. No, right. OK, so assume for now there's a class in the world called lecture. There's a method inside of it called lectures. And what that does is it returns an array of objects. And each of those objects represents a lecture. And inside that object is going to be an ID and a name for the lecture. All right, and thereafter, what am I doing with it? Well, I'm going to do the same exact thing as before, where if I want to alter the functionality of my view, I just have to pass in more data. So this time I'm passing in data in the form of this array called lectures. And so. If I now look in my view, let me go into views, lectures, index, notice that I now have this. So I've deleted the hard-coded lecture 0 and hard-coded lecture 1. I now have a for each loop. I'm iterating over the array I've passed in with lectures as lecture. And then I'm dynamically outputting on each iteration the current lecture's ID using object notation. So this is not an associative array. It's an object, hence the arrow. And then over here, I'm escaping that lecture's name. So now I no longer have to ever touch my view or my model or my controller for that matter. <laughs> All I have to do is add rows to the database, which I could do sort of, uh, I could cheat and just use PHP my admin, or I could implement like an administrative interface that I type lecture numbers and names in to a form. So it's a good question. Um, so CodeIgniter, one of CodeIgniter's proclaimed features is that they don't have a template and uh, they don't have a template language because typically a template language does almost the same thing as you, it does at least as much as you well. It can be approximated with actual PHP. The danger in using PHP for a templating language, especially for large projects, is that you can execute arbitrary PHP code, even though it's only supposed to do things aesthetically, like spit out an ordered list or text or the like. So often in, lar in companies or in projects where you have maybe uh, third-party developers or contractors who you want them to do the HTML work and you want them to do the design work, but you want your people who actually are tr more trustworthy to have access to the database and raw PHP code, Code, then you would use a templating engine like Smarty is a very popular one. And that is purely aesthetic. Um, and that's a little white lie. You can also execute arbitrary code, but you can disable it. So in short, CodeIgniter is nice in that you don't have to learn some arbitrary template library, but those do have value, especially for performance if you can start caching them. Um, and there's, again, client-side versions. So what's the M? Well, the last directory in here that's new is models. And notice that there are two files. These are almost identical. And these, frankly, are some of the nuisances, I think, of CodeIgniter, where the class is called lecture, but they make you uh, write the file name in lowercase. But this is not an uncommon PHP uh, paradigm. So in lecture is now a class that does not extend CI controller. It extends CI model. And all this does is it implements a method called get lectures, and it uses CodeIgniter's uh, syntax for executing a SQL query. So give me this CodeIgniter instances database object and select both ID and name from the table called lectures and order it by ID in ascending order. And then this last query here executes, um, it gets the results and then returns all of them as an array. And for those unfamiliar with CodeIgniter, frankly, CodeIgniter's uh, database library does not add all that much. This is essentially comparable 
if you recall to MySQL query, select ID name from lectures order by ID ascending, and then doing uh, the equivalent of while uh, row gets MySQL fetch asos, my oh, actually fetch object of result. We'll do this, lectures gets array, lectures gets row, return lectures. So if this looks unfamiliar, all CodeIgniter is doing is simplifying what in CS50 or similar you might have done a little more manually. Um, and so you can refer to the online documentation for their library that simplifies that. What's that? It can. So that is one of the upsides of using CodeIgniter's library, um, but there are, <coughs> it is using something called PDO, which we'll glance at briefly today or next time, um, but that is among the features. You don't have to call MySQL real escape string anymore if you use a number of these abstraction libraries. Yeah? Are we allowed to extend something like a doctrine record instead of CI model? Can we, can we use doctrine? Basically? Yeah, if you really want, sure. You can use other libraries if you think it lend itself to a better design. Sure. Other questions? All right, so where did the database connection come from? Just to close this loop. So when in doubt, check out the config. And in config, there's a lot of files, most of which we don't care about for now. But if I go into database, notice that most of this is comments, but I did have to fill in a few blanks. And you might have done this last week for lab one when you played around with CodeIgniter then. And the last thing I had to do was this. So CodeIgniter, for performance reasons, lets you specify in its configuration what libraries do you want to load in advance so that you don't have to require once this file, this file, this file, this file, which is going to result in their being interpreted, compiled, and not used potentially. So with this line here, auto load, I'm saying I want to use a database for this particular application. Make sure that this arrow DB is accessible to me. So when diving into Project Zero, don't get distracted as best you can by this sort of code igniter specific stuff that's not all that intellectually interesting. <laughs> Much more interesting to take away from this thus far is the fact that you have these models in one directory, controllers in another, views in another, and how they intercommunicate by way of method calls from one to the other. That's the interesting idea. Any questions? All right, let's take a five minute break. All right. So to um, everyone's awake now, but to help maintain that state, we've propped open some windows with erasers. So hopefully that will help here. And I'll get more interesting. All right. So now we get to have more fun design discussions, hopefully, specifically in the context of databases. So we spent some time reviewing the design docs and style guides that have come in over the past couple of days. Um, do realize that you're welcome to forge ahead now with your partner. Um, the, your uh, teaching fellow will be assigned later today. So you'll get an email specifying who your teaching fellow will be. If you have very pressing concerns, you're welcome at that point to email him or her to find out some answers. But we'll also get back to you over the next day or two with any glaring deficiencies that we felt might exist in your design, but no, do not feel obliged to wait on us. So um, databases. So this is something you'll likely make use of for this project or for some future project, whether it's in the form of a MySQL database, which is probably going to prove to be the common case, totally fine, very reasonable. Um, you might end up choosing in the context of iOS later on in the semester, uh, SQLite, which allows you to store an entire SQL database in a single binary file on disk, or in the case of iOS, on the iOS device itself. But you can still execute queries on it, even though it's not a server that's actually running. It's just a binary <laughs> file. But all of these databases, whether in de uh, MySQL form or SQLite form, are relational in nature. And what does this mean? Well, it means that you can think of them, frankly, like Excel spreadsheets with, table, with uh, tables that have rows and columns, and you might have multiple worksheets or multiple columns. Now, we, do use, we interface with these tables either via something like PHP MyAdmin, which is nice because it's just user friendly and it simplifies the process. But you can also use, as you saw before, the command line. And we'll use the command line in a little bit to establish two separate connections to a database and see what can go wrong if we simulate two different users trying to, say, withdraw money from a bank account from two different ATMs um, without implementing the database checks properly, as we shall see. So 
consider this example. So thus far, you're probably familiar with SQL and selecting data, inserting, update, and the like. But let's make sure everyone's on the same page with regard to more sophisticated queries. Still pretty simple, though, using what are called joins. And these can either be implicit or explicit. So for the sake of discussion, assume that some database has two tables at the moment. There is an employees table, which has an employee ID column and a name column, the first of which is numeric, the last of which is uh, strings. And then we have an orders column, which has a product ID, a product name, and an employee ID. And the employee ID signifies who sold that product uh, to some customer. So just looking at these two tables, does anything rub you wrong about the design of this? And this is actually taken from a website called W3Schools, which has plenty of things wrong with it. So <laughs> here's one of them. What's bad about the design? Ignore the query. We'll get there. What's bad? Just one employee can sell a certain product. OK, so, well, at the moment, OK, so this implies, this is, think of this as a, this is orders. So who sold that product? Well, if two, people, if two employees sold a chair, that's not reflected in that. OK, so if you have two people tag teaming, maybe you have a trainee and the senior salesman. OK, so we can't model that because we have to give credit to one person. That might be reasonable, but, but fair. Yeah. OK, good. So if the customer comes in and buys quantity 30, we're going to have 30 rows when, frankly, we could probably get away with one with an additional field like quantity. What else? Yeah. There should probably be a products table that matches product ID to product rather than just putting both of those in, in the orders table. Yeah, this is what rubs me the, 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 the wrong way the most. So these tables are not in uh, what we call 3NF or third normal form. And this is just a fancy way of saying there is unnecessary, there's the potential for unnecessary redundancy in at least one of these tables. And by redundancy, we mean exactly this. Notice that you've got printer, table, and chair, and each of those is apparently uniquely identified by a product ID. And yet the implication of this orders table here on the right-hand side is that if we sell another chair, another printer, another table, not only is the product ID going to end up as in another row of that table, and that's OK, but so is the name again and again and again and again. And it's just not necessary. There's an easy opportunity here to have, as you proposed, a products table. And what field should probably be in that products table? Yeah. Exactly. As simple as that. So product ID and product name. Now the problem, of course, is that if you factor out product name from that table, but you want to execute queries in the future that give you back the person's name or employee ID, the product name, and the product number, it feels like you're going to have to select from this table, select from this table, select from this table. So we've gone from one SQL query to three. For instance, well, you can, and that seems to suggest that we slowed things down just to be anal about keeping everything nice and neat. But the reality is, this is how relational databases are meant to be used, and they allow you to join tables again so as to create temporary tables in memory that contain precisely the information that you want. So here's a s simple example that doesn't even use yet the keyword join. If I want to select employee, an employee's name and the product name, uh, from these tables, I can do this syntax here. Select employees.name, comma, orders.product. So you just very explicitly mention not just the field name, but the table from which it comes. That's not strictly necessary. You can get away with just saying the field name if it doesn't exist in both places. Otherwise, it's ambiguous, but better stylistically, perhaps, to be ever so readable like this. From employees, comma, order. So you put a comma separated list of the tables from which you want to pull this data, where employees ID equals employees ID in each of the tables. So in other words, this is implying that you should take this table here with employee ID, and this table here, and if you can imagine in your mind taking one table, moving them around on the screen, and overlaying them in such a way that the employee IDs line up, what do you get? You get a slightly wider table that contains the information you care about, or specifically all you're asking for back is name and product. So the table you get back is going to look like this. So all this while, if you've been using SQL before, CS50 Finance or the like, or this current project last week, what you're doing when you select is getting back result sets, but you can really think of those as temporary tables in memory. And so in this case now, we can iterate over this as with MySQL Fetch a SOS or with CodeIgniter's equivalent, and we can print out that Ola sold this, and Steven sold this, and Steven also sold this.
So what's the point here? Well, this is a very simple example, but certainly this model here is not going to scale very well. You're just going to be spending a ridiculous number of bytes for large data sets redundantly. Moreover, what's a future performance implication if you store table, 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 as well as its number 657 all over the place? Yeah. Yeah, something simple, right? Like you just want to change the name. Now you have to do an update on this entire table, have the, change all these rows, which is going to trigger a re-indexing of that table potentially, which itself is going to be slow. So in short, there's just no reason to do this. So the goal of any table design, certainly for Project Zero, is to ask yourself, is there any redundancy here? And can I factor something out? Another canonical example is zip codes. If you are storing an address book of people, you've got a name, first name, last name, phone number, city, state, zip. Well, which of those should actually be filtered out from that, factored out from that table? Yeah, so city state, right? It might feel very natural to just have every row in the table have a user's entire address, but do I really need Cambridge, comma, mass for 02138, 02138, all over the place? Rather, I can probably use 02138 as a key, store only that in my address book table, <laughs> and then have a zip codes table that maps zip code to city state. Now, that's a bit of an overstatement because the US has made a mess of the postal codes, and so there are actually multiple city names sometimes for given zip codes. Um, but that's sort of an uh, uh, orthogonal problem. But the idea of factoring it out is at least uh, a good takeaway here. So let's be more explicit as to what we're actually joining here. So before, now, after. So the syntax is slightly different, but it allows you now to express with the SQL join, uh, join keyword exactly what you want to do. So let's select name and product from the employees table joined on orders. So the fact that I've written this on three lines, totally arbitrary. It's just for formatting's sake. So the table I'm selecting from now is employees join orders. But what do you mean join uh, on those two tables? You have to specify. Join on employees.employeeid such that it equals orders.employeeid. So in other words, take these two tables and line them up in such a way that the employee IDs line up on both sides. Now, as an aside, there's other types of joins that might very well be relevant to even Project Zero or future projects. There's left joins, there's right joins, there's full joins, inner, outer joins. So this is an example um, of this is the default join scenario. But suppose that one of these tables had, um, suppose there was employee number five, like Dave, Malin, comma, David, and he hadn't sold anything. Well, when you join two tables like this, they're only going to join rows that match in both tables. But if you wanted to ensure that even Malin, comma, David appeared in the output, even though he's not sold anything, you could explicitly say, you know what, do a left join. Because why left? Well, literally in this case, employees is on the left, orders is on the right. But in terms of code, employees comes first, join orders. So if you put this all on one line, employees is on the left, uh, products, uh, orders is on the right. So a left join would say, make sure I get all employee IDs from one table, even if there's nulls in the resulting output. And sometimes you do care about this if you don't want to lose track of people or data. Yeah? Um, so I, they do, in fact, do exactly the same thing. Part of it is just personal choice. Um, and this actually, I would say this one actually makes a little more clear exactly what's going on, but to each his own. Well, so this is allowing us to do the default join. If you actually wanted to do left join, right join, then you obviously have to use the explicit keyword. So it's really up to you as to what style you'd want to practice. All right, so tuck that away. And now let's consider some issues of efficiency. So the database for Harvard courses for Project Zero is actually non-trivially sized. FAS has several thousand courses over the course of a year. And so searches could very well end up being somewhat slow, especially if your own laptop is slow and you're running the appliance and you're running a database server inside of the appliance. You'd, ideal during development and playing around that you don't want queries to take a full second or five seconds. And you can actually uh, mitigate against these performance issues by designing your tables in the right way. So primary keys, you're probably all familiar with. The primary key in a table just defines what? Uh, 
a unique identifier for that table. So it's, if you have a, a, a student's table, their Harvard ID number is probably the primary key. Or in the case of products, the product ID was probably the primary key. So beyond just specifying uniqueness, a primary key also gives you what's called an index. So MySQL and other database engines, Microsoft Access, uh, Oracle and the like, they build up for you at your request indices, so high performance uh, data structures. They're typically B trees, if you've taken CS124 or similar. And these are data structures that make it a lot easier to search on values in the table, whether it's strings or numbers. So this makes sense. For a primary key, we are very often selecting based on ID number. So you ideally want to get back answers quickly. In the worst case, if you don't have an index, what's the running time of select going to be? Just intuitively. It's going to be a big O of N, right? If there's no index, the best you can do, if it's not sorted even, is search from top to bottom and find the row that you care about. So it turns out you can do other things too. If you have a field that isn't a primary key per se, but it is going to be unique, well, you can specify it as a unique index. And we'll see this through PHP MyAdmins interface in just a moment. What's an example of a type of field that you might want to say is unique, but isn't necessarily your primary key? Any examples? Email. Yeah, email's a perfect one. So you might have a table of users which ha who have names and IDs and email addresses. Why is email not the best primary key? Uh, it's lengthy. It's uh, lengthy. It could change. Yeah, exactly. So it's lengthy and it could change. And by lengthy, we mean if you're just using an int as your unique identifier or even a big int where you're only using four or eight bytes, whereas an email <laughs> address could be many more bytes than that. So you want it to enforce uniqueness, but not necessarily be the thing that you search on. So that's a perfect example. Um, an index. An index is just a field that has no special properties per se, but you know you want to search on it. Now in the context of Harvard courses, you might want to search on um, courses names or courses numbers and, or courses departments. And you don't want to go overboard. One of the tensions you'll feel is, well, I could just make everything an index and click, 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 click. But what's perhaps the intuitive downside of making everything an index? Yeah. Yeah, or not rows per se, but metadata. So adding these B trees or other data structures. You're just using bytes to expedite searches on that field. And so then, in theory, things could slow down. If you're trying to cram too much in memory, you start paging to disk, and you can't keep everything in RAM. So there's this trade-off. You should really choose your indices intelligently and not just ad hoc. And then finally, there's full text, which kind of does what it says. If you have a large chunks of text, like articles from a blog or the like, and you want to be able to do keyword searches, a full text search is optimized for exactly that, where you can do substring matching uh, within a particular database field. All right, so let's actually see this. If I go into PHP MyAdmin, and let's go ahead and go over to my lectures table. Actually, let's just make a new one. So let me go to my database. I'm going to say sections for a course that has sections. I don't quite know how many columns yet, so I'll do, well, actually, no, let's do users. So users, three. All right, so I, a user is going to have an ID, a user is going to have an email address, and a user is going to have a name. And now we have some schema design choices. What do we want to use to identify users in a database? You don't have too many options, but so int's pretty reasonable. What's the uh, upside of an int? It's small, right? It's already selected for me. No work involved, right? <laughs> so, and downsides? Yeah, absolutely. If you use something that's too small, and maybe a 32-bit int is too small if your users sometimes come and go and they add or delete their accounts or they create lots of fake accounts or the like. You know, you could imagine using up the various ints. And even though MySQL and other database engines support auto-increment, auto-increment's purpose in life is to forge ahead in perpetuity. Even if you delete user 123, um, you're, the auto-increment feature is not going to go fill in that blank in the future. Rather, you're going to have gaps in your data. And you could go back <laughs> back and manually condense everything, but this could break URLs that are out there on the internet. Think of Facebook URLs if you haven't chosen like a name on Facebook, but rather you just have question mark ID equals 12345. That's your Facebook ID. You don't really want to change users' IDs on them, nor do you want to change globally your whole database. So frankly, these days, spending eight bytes instead of four per user is not all that unreasonable. Um, and frankly, this is one of those sort of Y2K-like decisions. You might as well make the right decision now rather than have to change everything some number of months or a couple years years later. So big int is reasonable. But int, not bad. Um, if we scroll down a little bit, 
uh, length and value. This is meaningless for ints. You're going to get uh, 32 or 64 bits no matter what you put there. As an aside, if you've ever seen the number 10 or 11 in MySQL, if you recall seeing this with regard to ints, it's stupid and historical. It just refers to how many characters you can fit on the screen if you're using the command line version, the black and white window, to talk to MySQL. It formats the width of the columns. It has nothing to do with bit size. Uh, attributes. So what should I probably choose here? Yeah, unsigned, right? Unless I'm going to actually have negative IDs, I might as well not waste 2 billion or even more, uh, some, many quadrillion numbers just by allowing for negatives. Shouldn't be null. What about index? Yeah, primary makes sense. Nice and efficient, 8 bytes. And sure, I'll go ahead and do auto increment. Now, how about email? I have a few types to choose from. And let me scroll down to the ones that are germane here. There's all my string types. Which one do you want? OK, varchar y. Okay. The variable length. OK, so it's variable length. All right, so how long is an email address? 50 characters. 50? OK. So this is where you kind of should pause, right? Like, could be, but you could have crazy long email addresses. And if you don't check for those things when users register, you know, could end up with unanticipated consequences. Um, what to choose? You know, frankly, erring on the side of too much is probably best. Um, and frankly, I out of sort of anal habits tend to choose multiples of two, but 50 is fine as well. Um, but you might also see historically 255 was very common for years because old versions of MySQL only supported lengths up to that. You might see 65,535, which is a 16-bit value. Um, and there's other numbers that are common, but it's up to you. All right, but what else could I have chosen? What would be the advantage of char over varchar? Yeah. It's always 10 characters. It's a fill with spaces. Right? Yeah. So it's always 10 or it's always 50 characters. So on the upside, that actually facilitates searching because I can actually then do random access to email addresses and I can search a table more effectively because I know what the boundaries are. And that's very useful. I don't have to search for the boundary or the equivalent of backslash zero if you think back to C. But the downside of using a char field as opposed to varchar? You do, right? Like if your address is like mailing at me.com, like I'm wasting a lot of bytes, just null bytes, just to pad it to length 50. So for an email address, varchar is pretty reasonable. But again, these are the kinds of decisions that are perhaps non-obvious. Do you want it to be null? Well, you have to decide that for yourself if you want to allow it to be null for an email address. Probably not if the users have to register for it. Auto increment doesn't make sense. And this, we said unique before, so let's go with that. And then up here for name, what do you think? It's kind of in the same bucket as name, right? Like, I don't know. Like, let's just err on this. 128 is probably fine, give or take. Um, being consistent, though, now I'd probably be anal and I'd go back and say, fine, it's going to be the same. <laughs> I win. <laughs> um, and then as for this, any indices? So maybe, right? Like if you want to facilitate searching on users' names, sort of Facebook style autocomplete in the little search box, maybe. We would actually want to put an index on this field to search by that field. Um, for now, we're not implementing Facebook. We just have a user's table, so we won't. But that would be among the questions to ask yourself. Yeah, Carl. So why wouldn't it be 127? Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. Oh, uh, it doesn't. Wait, why would it be? Oh, yeah, but then that's not a power of, it's, yeah, so then I just like powers of two. Um, I actually don't know what the additional byte was, it was probably used for the terminator of some sort, um, but now, eh, there's no terminator, at least at this boundary length, so, good point. Touche. All right. <laughs> Um, but here's now another juicy question that you probably have completely ignored if you've used PHP MyAdmin before. What table engine are you going to use? Now, by default, in recent versions of MySQL, you get InnoDB, which is the data, uh, which is the format in which your data is going to be stored. If you're familiar, um, in the world of file systems, if you've taken 61 or 161, you might know of NTFS, HFS Plus, any number of other uh, FAT32 file systems. Actually, in 50, we did talk about FAT16 in the context of compact flashcards. So these are just uh, standards that the world has decided on for storing data on disk. 
database engines are just standards that the worlds have decided on, for, or MySQL in this case, for storing database data. But you get different features from some of these. So InnoDB actually offers something called transactions, which we'll see in just a moment. But you pay a little bit of a price in terms of performance. By contrast, MyISAM, which was the most popular and default for some time, you don't get transactions. You get something called locks, but you get uh, often faster reads. So there's some trade-offs there. There's some others. The memory <laughs> table actually does what it says. It makes your tables live entirely in RAM. Why would this be compelling? Yeah. It's super fast, right? You're never touching disk. It's in RAM. But what's the downside? It right, doesn't persist, right? So this is good if you want to implement your own sort of caching engine. We'll talk later in the term about popular caching engines like Memcached, which Facebook and others tend to use. Um, but you can implement very quick reads yourself, especially if you don't care about it persisting. There's others. Archive is essentially um, uh, archive is uh, automatically compressed for you, and there's a whole bunch of others, both for cluster file, cluster databases, and other features. So for now, I'll leave it as InnoDB. But for high performance queries, there's generally a decision point to be made between InnoDB or my ISAM. All right, so what are some of those decision points? Well, this is way more data than we should care about, but this is straight from the MySQL documentation. And among my ISAM, memory tables, InnoDB, uh, archive, and NDB, the last of which is network database, which is for clustered file systems, um, there are a whole bunch of different features that each of these things support. But I alluded to transactions earlier, which at the moment only the network database uh, engine and InnoDB support. Uh, full text search engines, recall the full text search index before, that is only supported on my ISAM. So there you have to decide, and we'll see what transactions are in just a moment, but if you want transactions, guess what you give up? Full text searches. But that's OK, because you can mix table engines within a database. So you can have one table use one, another table use the other, and just make sure that your data is factored out in such a way that the uh, data you want a full text search on is in one table, and the things you care about transactions on are in the other. So when I took one CS161, Margo Seltzer was teaching it at the time, and she told this story that I've always remembered since about uh, problems that can arise in dorm rooms with refrigerators. And the simple story goes, suppose that you come home after class one day and you really want some milk. And so you go to your little dorm fridge, you open the door, you see, damn, we're out of milk. So you close the door, you leave your <laughs> dorm room, you go across the street to CVS and get in line to buy some milk. Meanwhile, your roommate comes home and he or she uh, opens the fridge, wants some milk, damn, there's no milk, closes the fridge walks out, goes across the street to some other store or the other CVS and gets in line to buy some milk. You come home, put milk in the fridge. He or she comes home and, damn, now we have uh, bought way too much milk, right? Because <laughs> neither of us really likes milk in the first place, but that was the way Margot told the story. So what is the problem here? Well, you have uh, access to this shared resource. But you looked at the state of the world, then you made some action based on it, and then you updated the state of the world. But simultaneously, someone else, your roommate in this case, might very well have been doing the exact same thing, synchronously, in parallel. And you know that computers today are uh, often multi-threaded, which means even if they have one CPU, they create the illusion of parallelism, of multiple things happening at once. But really, if you have two threads doing something in a computer, this guy might do a couple operations, take a few CPUs cycles, then this guy might go, then this guy, then this guy. So even though to the human it looks like they're operating at the same speed and at the same time, really their operations could be intermingled, much like my actions of opening the fridge, walking to the store, might overlap with my roommates. So in the real world, uh, assuming you like milk, how do you solve this problem so that you don't end up with twice as much milk as you care to have? Yeah? Put a note on the fridge, right? You put a post-it note on the fridge saying, gone for milk, right? And so that should hopefully provide your roommate with a clue. It should lock them out effectively of actually inspecting the state of this world and misinterpreting um, what the outcome should be. Or you could literally, if we want to borrow database terminology, you could lock the fridge, right? You could padlock it so that they can't even see inside of the refrigerator. So it turns out in databases, we can do exactly this sort of thing. Um, consider the following code that you might have used in a SQL query for, say, CS50's problem set 7, if you did that one. 
So you may recall for CS50 Finance, we wanted to enable users to buy shares of stocks, but sometimes the user might reasonably want to buy more shares of a stock. Now, what might happen in this situation um, is a little worrisomely, worrisome. And so we just kind of told you in 50 blindly, just use a query like this and bad things won't happen. Well, now we're talking about the bad things. This query is atomic, which means that it will either all execute or not at all, it will not be interrupted by any other SQL queries that touch that same table, which in this case is called table. So what does that mean? Well, this query, as you can kind of infer, it's going to try inserting into the table an ID, symbol, and shares, those three specific values. But if there's a collision, in other words, if there's already a row in the table for user ID 7 trying to buy that penny stock AFLB-OB, well then it's instead going to increment the number of shares by this amount, which in this case is going to be 10. So in other words, you kind of do want that to happen all at once. You want to either insert that new row or update what's there, but you don't want something to happen in the meantime. <coughs> Why? What might happen if you did this kind of update with multiple queries and not this one liner, which happens to wrap onto two? Yeah? So between when you get the number of shares that they have um, and inserting the new number or updating the number, they could have bought something okay. or, or sold their shares. So it, it decreased in between, but you still incremented the original value? Perfect. Right. So if you, did, if you broke this up into multiple queries, your first query might be select. <laughs> select the number of shares that this user has for this penny stock. And suppose that number is uh, 12. Well, then in your next query, you might say, oh, well, I got rows back, which means they already own this stock. So let me do an update where I change the value of that row to be 12 plus whatever the number of shares is that they want to buy, 10 in this case, so 22. But what if, just by bad luck, that same user or maybe a malicious user with multiple laptops or multiple ATMs is trying to create a situation in which the queries get interwoven? So I check and I see I have 12 shares. But suppose in the other window, the user happens, or in a separate browser tab, they happen to buy more shares or sell some shares. So the number of shares they actually have is actually no longer 12. And then that thread gets suspended. And the original thread does 12 plus 10, giving me 22 shares. That might not be the correct answer anymore. Because when I check the refrigerator, the state of the world subsequently changed because I didn't block out all other roommates or all other threads. So we need a way of solving this. And the brute force way of solving this is just to say, stay out of this table. Right? You can literally padlock the refrigerator or you can padlock the MySQL table and you can say no one else can write to this table at this moment in time. How do you do that? Well, these are just four SQL queries back to back. You could execute these at the blinking black and white prompt uh, at the terminal window in MySQL or you could implement um, then with PHP's MySQL underscore query or with CodeIgniter's query method. But in short, you specify lock tables, the name of the table you want to lock, which let's call it account, come back to the money example, for writes. So you don't want anyone else to write to this table. If they read, fine, whatever, but writes are the dangerous one because they can change the state of the refrigerator. Next, I do select balance from account where number is two. So account number is two. So give me account number two's account balance. And then go ahead and update the account setting the balance equals to 1,500, where number equals 2, then unlock tables. So ignore or just uh, assume that we care to do 1,500 for some reason, though there might be some logic in PHP code intermingled among these four lines. But the point is that lines 2 and 3 will execute together or not at all. They cannot be interrupted. But logically <laughs> now, what's the downside of this solution? to this problem of what's called a race condition, where both you and your roommate, uh, so to speak, are racing to get milk and your operations are overlapping. Yeah? Well, if someone else wants to write to a different record, then they'd have to sit there waiting. Exactly. So we may be updating record number two, account number two in this case, but there could be hundreds or thousands of other accounts in my bank system. And this, unfortunately, with my ISAM tables and with locks, you're literally shutting everyone out. Now, if you don't have a popular website, not a big deal. But if you do have hundreds or thousands of transactions per second, which is not uncommon on the web today, well, you're really going to impede your performance. This is a huge bottleneck that everyone then has to go through. But you now don't run into a situation where account balances are incorrect. What's uh, other downsides? Yeah. Perfect. And 
Perfect. So you can find yourself in situations, the general topic is known as deadlock, where both people are waiting for the refrigerator to be open. So both you and your roommate are stupidly standing there because the note is there somehow, and you got yourself into a situation where <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> they not, I'm pushing the analogy a little too far now. <laughs> But that would be the physical incarnation of deadlock, where you're both waiting for the same resource to become available for some reason. So, in short, this is a very heavy handed solution, but there is a more fine grained one if you ditch my ISAM. And use InnoDB, which again has become the default for MySQL anyway, but you do give up some things. A little bit of performance in some types of queries, but more uh, uh, relevantly to before, full text queries go out the window. You can't use them for that. So in InnoDB tables, you don't say lock anymore, you instead say start transaction. This has some synonyms. You can also say begin or a couple other things, but start transaction is the proper SQL way. So here we're doing update, suppose the following scenario happens update the account, set my account balance to balance minus 1,000, where the account number is 2, and then update this other guy's account balance to plus 1,000, where account number is 1. In other words, transfer $1,000 from this account. To this account. Kind of ideal if these two transactions are not interrupted, right? So that the money actually exists、um, when the transfer happens. So, how can we do this? Well, with transactions, we can actually do not only updates and inserts, we can do selects, check the value to see if something bad actually happened, and then only commit the transaction if everything is good. And by this, I mean the following start transaction. Let me go ahead and update the account, setting the balance equal to balance minus $1,000, where the account number is 2. So, in other words, debit $1,000 from this account. Then go ahead and add $1,000 to this account. Account number one. And then let me do a sanity check. And there might be some PHP code intermingled here. We're just looking at the SQL queries, top to bottom. Select the balance from account where number equals two. If I detect in my PHP code that the value I just got back is actually negative, this is bad, right? Something bad has happened. I've tried debiting more money than this person has. So what do I do? Well, thankfully, with transactions, you can literally execute the SQL query roll back, which will undo everything you just did. Up until the point of start transaction. The only exception is things like drop table, drop database cannot be un,、uh, unrolled, but you should not be doing that programmatically anyway. <laughs> right? So, in this way, you can ensure effectively that all four, or really all six of these queries are executed all at once or not at all. You won't get your database into some <laughs> inconsistent state. So, what's the takeaway here? Anytime you have tables, Especially multiple tables where you might need to update two things at once. I need to, up, to remove some money from this person, add some money to this person. The problem is that, again, if、um, those same rows are touched by a different thread, whether accidentally or maliciously by an adversary trying to create this race condition, you don't want to end up giving someone more money or less money than they're actually owed. So let's go ahead and、um, let's see if we can see this here. Let me go into. Uh, the appliance. Let me SSH to. All right, it's here, Crimson. So MySQL U, jharvard P,、uh, jharvard underscore lecture two. All right, so now I'm logged into the database at a blinking command prompt here. And let me go ahead and open up a second window. We'll move it over here, SSH to the same system. Let's do MySQL U, jharvard P, jharvard underscore lecture two, crimson. All right, so now I'm connected at a MySQL prompt. So this is essentially like the non graphical version of PHP MyAdmin. So let me go into <laughs> PHP MyAdmin, and just for the sake of discussion, let me go ahead and create a table called, let's say, cash and two columns. So, this will be the user ID and this will be the amount of cash that he has. So, we'll just do an int. We'll do a decimal, which a decimal, recall, is a very precise number. It can have, let's say, 65 numbers and two, period,、uh, two numbers after the period. This will be a primary. And this will be, whoops. OK, a y so now I have this cache table. So now, if unfamiliar with the command line, notice that I can do the following show tables, semicolon. This shows me exactly what's in my tables.、Um, if I do,、uh, let's say,、um, select star from cache, I get an empty set. So suppose I want to do this insert into cache, let's say ID cache, let's say user one is going to get, let's say, $100. All right, and then we'll user two, we'll get $200. All right, so now select star from cache. 
Okay, so that's correct. And now let's go ahead and do this. Start transaction, semicolon. If you see the arrow, it means you forgot the semicolon like I just did. All right, so now let's go ahead and say update cache uh, set cache equal to, let's say, let's say, uh, how do I want to update this? Let's go ahead and cache equals cache minus 100 where ID equals one, but meanwhile, so that thread got suspended. So my alt tabbing is equivalent to that thread being put to sleep for whatever accidental operating system reason. So now I'm gonna go here and just do select star from cache. All right, so that's good. So now let me go ahead and do update cache set cache uh, equal to cache minus 100, where ID equals one. So what is this? You can think of this as the Bank of America's implementation of their ATM, right? I'm at an ATM. When I say, give me $100 out of the machine, and after typing my PIN, this is the query maybe that's executed. Um, by default, queries in MySQL are auto-committed. So we've had this notion of commit all this time. It's just they've all happened automatically. Every query is auto-committed. But if I do this now, it is indeed executed. So now select star from cache and he has zero dollars. So now let's go over here and hit enter. Okay, so that's good. Select star from cash. So this is the other ATM machine if I'm kind of like uh, tag teaming on two different side-by-side -side ATMs here. Okay, that's bad. Right? So that should not have been allowed to happen. But hopefully, if Bank of America implemented their ATM correctly, they have executed, after the update, a select doing a sanity check. Has it gone negative? Because if so, damn it, we don't want to give this guy his $100, so we better not commit this transaction. Let's instead do roll back. OK, now let's reselect the table and it's back to zero. So even though that was a simple one query, we could have rolled back a dozen queries in this way if we wanted to. So any questions on what problem we're actually trying to solve here with transactions? And for those who don't want to raise their hand, oh, yep. A good question. Um, so CodeIgniter does support transactions by way of a PHP method call. To be honest, I, your TF might disagree. I am underwhelmed by CodeIgniter's MySQL um, or database library. It's, to me, it's just rewriting what is raw SQL queries anyway. Uh, to, frankly, I think doing something like this is very reasonable in CodeIgniter where you do your own SQL queries in the actual query method. And in this way, could you then execute begin transaction yourself, roll back yourself? So you can use the MySQL library. I've just been unimpressed with, it doesn't really do anything for me other than force me to learn their syntax. Um, plus, it's easier to express, I think, more sophisticated SQL queries if you're doing it yourself. Other questions? All right, so PDO. So on top of uh, what CodeIgniter is actually doing is even though we configured it for a MySQL database, it actually can support any number of databases. And MySQL is just one of them. Could use Oracle, could use Microsoft Access. And that's because CodeIgniter does not use MySQL underscore whatever. All of those functions we've typically used in CS50 are obviously tied to MySQL as per their names. But this isn't the best design, right? If your website's getting popular and someone decides, well, we really need a bigger database, although frankly, MySQL does scale quite well, but someone decides that you need to change the database back in, it's kind of unfortunate if you have to go through and change all of your function calls throughout your entire program just to change your database. So a recurring theme already in CSS, in today with views and whatnot, has been abstracting away some of these details. And so PDO is actually the library used underneath the hood in CodeIgniter to create this abstraction library. So what does this mean? PDO is portable data objects. And this just means it's a more generic library that has support for fetching data, for selecting, for inserting, for updating, for transactions, but it's independent of MySQL. It converts the commands to Oracle or to MySQL or to whatever database backend you're using so that you yourself don't have to th worry about this ever <laughs> in the future. Um, so, and frankly, you can also then avoid the horrific uh, function, call, function names like MySQL real escape string. Moreover, with libraries like this, CodeIgniter and in turn PDO, 
All that crazy stuff we did do in 50 with MySQL real escape string, you can forget about because all you have to do is call a prepare method, for instance, and any variables you pass in, CodeIgniter or really PDO will automatically escape for you, which is a huge boon for security because you no longer have to remember yourself. The library does it all for you. So this is a super simple example of PHP code you might use in your own applications. CodeIgniter does this for you, so you don't need to go paste this into Project Zero, but it boils down to this, um, a data source. Uh, uh, data source, which is in this case type MySQL. The database name is jharvard underscore lecture, semicolon host equals this. And 127.0.0.1 is the IP address of any, most any server by default. This is an ugly cryptic looking string, but it's just convention to pass this in and the PDO library will parse it. Um, then we have username password, and then there's this notion. We'll come back to this before long, but for those unfamiliar or less familiar with exceptions, it's a way, again, as we discussed a week or two ago, of passing error messages back that are not in the form of return values, but this gives us ultimately what we'll call a database handle. And with that database handle, can we then actually execute some prepared statements as follows? Let me go ahead and just pull up for now a simple text editor. Just to paint a picture of something we'll see before long in more detail, you can do things like this. Statement gets database handle. That's what DBH is often short for. Uh, prepare, let's say select star from table where ID equals question mark. And what you can then do here is statement bind value, and what you can do is one, comma, and then ID. So suppose for the sake of discussion that dollar sign ID <laughs> is the user's ID in question, what you can do with this bind value is bind to it whatever question marks were in your original query, the MySQL real escaped version of that variable. So moreover, there's another reason, because obviously this already feels like a little more work than we used to do with MySQL. What else does this do? Well, the upside of prepared statements for performance is that if you're using a SQL query in a loop, as you might be for Harvard courses, querying course after course after course, or something like that, and you're executing the same query again and again, what the prepare statement, as prepare method does, is it essentially pre-compiles that query. Or rather, it tells MySQL, I'm going to be calling the same exact query, differing only in terms of one or two values, again and again and again, please optimize for that. So that on each subsequent execution of that same query, it's much faster than it would be otherwise. So these are generally known as SQL as prepared statements. And you don't need this cryptic numbering. It's, unfortunately, it's one indexed. It's not <coughs> zero indexed. Um, this is a little cryptic, I think. So more compelling, I think, is to use colon and then something like ID. And then what you can do is this. You can ditch the whole ex binding manually, and you can instead do this. You can execute that statement, passing in for any of these name parameters, something like this. So you pass in an associative array that then maps values to the placeholders that you put in. So if you think back to percent %s in printf, colon whatever is now the new placeholder for this library. So realize this is a better way of doing those kinds of substitutions. All right, so an opportunity now for some design decisions that will hopefully reaffirm how amazing your design is or how much room for improvement there might be. So let me go into, uh, I'll go into the file here. Let's see. Let me go into courses.xml, which is a pretty big file. If you find that it's hanging when you open it up in a browser, it's just because the browser is not very good at opening 10 meg uh, XML files. So open it in text edit or something like that. So here is the very first snippet here. And let's see. Um, just for the sake of discussion, and there's not really right answers, but there are some bad answers, I would say. Um, what, how many tables or what tables should you probably be thinking about creating? You could have one big table. Um, but let me say, based on some design documents we've seen, if any table you ever make in life ever has more than 50 columns, 100 columns, that's bad. Okay, that's in the bad design category. Um, the reason being, that usually suggests that what, you've really, what you should really be doing is factoring whatever data is in those fields out and making them rows instead of columns. The, the principle that should guide you with designing database schemas for, my, for SQL is relatively few columns, but an infinite number potentially of rows, or at least millions or billions of rows. But the width of tables should not be that large. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's flesh out some of these details. So a course has what things that we need to associate with it? 
We don't need to have all this data in your database necessarily. What's it? Core. Terms offered, okay, is it fall or spring? And we say in the spec that it suffices just to import the spring courses. So you can even throw that detail away and only import spring courses. Yeah? Okay, so department, and this is an annoying Harvard little thing, right? Like there's the Department of African and Amer African American Studies, and then there's just African and African American Studies. Uh, computer science is under Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences, which technically doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that makes searching sort of annoying. And in fact, those of you who are C uh, concentrators, if you go to the Q Guide, we're still categorized under the entire school instead of the subject area. But so be it. So that's up to you to decide. I would argue from a UI perspective that I am not in the habit of searching for the Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So maybe using what Harvard calls course group is maybe a little more uh, consistent with normal students' mentalities. <laughs> what else do we need to associate with courses? Yeah. Faculty. All right, so faculty. And faculty is an interesting one. So suppose I have a courses table, and a course, the course table at the moment has the course title, let's say. It needs a unique identifier. What's the best candidate? A catalog number, except, and we did post this on the help board. Anyone come across an interesting corner case yet? Yeah? Yeah, so an applied math class and a religion class somehow both have the same catalog number. So <laughs> welcome to our world um, in playing with this data. So we've emailed the registrar. For now, it suffices to uh, skip, I think, the religion course, which isn't offered this term, but like next fall. But you can handle that however you see fit. For, for cases like that, I mean, is it better to have our own local ID and then it's a really good question. Um, on the one hand, that would be compelling because then it's deterministic and you control the input source. On the other hand, the, the catalog number is supposed to uniquely identify courses. And I would argue that I would shy away actually from having your own unique identifier only because if you want to rerun whatever script you're writing to import the data, if you want to re-import the data, you have to somehow in perpetuity remember those mappings that you made. And it just seems like unnecessary complexity to me at least. Uh, catalog number is in the very top. Uh, cat num, where is it? There it is, cat num. So faculty, though, is an interesting one. Does it belong in the courses table? Right, this is where you might, if you did this automatically, might have 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 columns. Right? You probably don't want columns called faculty 1, faculty 2, faculty 3. <laughs> Why? Well, one, you're kind of violating just the intuitive uh, boundaries of like don't have lots of columns. But two, is there really an upper bound? Right? In reality, you're not going to have 1,000 faculty members teaching a course, but where do you draw that line? If it's four faculty members, what if there's a fifth at one point? If it's six, what if there's a seventh? So whenever you have that tension where you have to decide how many of these do I need, it probably means you want to grow vertically, not laterally. So if I wanted to have a separate faculty table, what should go in the faculty table versus the courses table? Yeah. Okay, so the name of the professor. ID. So his or her ID. So that's an attribute in the XML file. The course's catalog number. Uh, so the course's catalog numbers. Okay, so suppose I did this. Not bad, but push back now. Yeah, so what about people who teach multiple courses? Now we run into the employees products issue where we see table, 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 right? We see mail in, mail in, mail in, mail in, or whatever the name is. And so we, can, we should actually factor that out probably. And so what people will typically do is um, they'll have a third table um, and they'll say like course faculty. And often the convention, you can decide on, your, decide on your own style, is to use the name of one table concatenated with the name of the other, usually with underscores, but just be consistent. Don't use all caps. I'm just doing that because I'm using a text editor here. Um, but what would we have under course faculty then? Faculty ID, course ID and faculty. Good. So we would say something like faculty ID and then let's say catnum. Um, and even Catnum, you want to be careful because the same, I think the same course has the same catalog number, even if it's offered both terms, fall and spring. So you want to be careful there that maybe you need a second key there that's maybe term ID. But maybe you can ignore that because we say you only need to support spring. So you could maybe ignore that detail. But this lends itself to an interesting design issue. It turns out that this is probably a candidate for a primary, a primary key, even though it's a little long, it's a string. Um, this is a pretty good candidate for a primary key. Is this a primary key or is this? So not really, but it is a key. 
it's what we'll call a foreign key. So anytime you have a primary key from one table in another table's fields, you call it a foreign key. But the reason for this extends beyond the semantics. If I go back to uh, PHP MyAdmin, and suppose I have, let me do this real fast. Let me do a courses table that's going to have just two columns, an ID and a name. And this one's going to be varchar 255, enter. Um, I'm going to make the ID field a primary key. Now I'm going to really fast make a faculty table with two columns, just an ID and a name, and 255. And again, I'm going to make this a primary key, enter. So now I'm going to create this uh, join table, so to speak, where I'm going to call it course faculty. It's going to have two columns for now. We'll ignore the term issue. And the convention is if you call something ID in one table, in the course table, you should probably call it course ID, and this should be faculty ID, so it's clear to you, the human, what it's mapping to. But let me go ahead and say these are both ints. Let me say that this is actually meant to be indexed, because I do want to search on it, but it's not a primary key, and it's not necessarily unique if you have multiple faculty teaching the same course. Let me go ahead and click Save there. But now let me do this. In PHP MyAdmin, notice that there's this relation view. If I click on relation view, notice that I can somehow tie this field, course ID, to all of the other tables in my database. And so if I highlight this, <laughs> let's say course, courses.id, I can tell MySQL that there's this inherent linkage between the courses table and this course faculty table. And moreover, once I select this linkage and then scroll over, notice that I can specify these rules, on delete or on update, do the following. You can tell the database to cascade the results or to delete as a result of one table changing. In other words, if I delete Malin from the faculty table, that should, if I set up these triggers, so to speak, should result in all of Malin's courses from the course faculty table automatically being deleted for me. And I no longer have to manually do that with SQL tables. Moreover, this constraint will ensure sure that just in case I do something stupid, I cannot technologically input an invalid faculty member's ID or an invalid course ID into the course faculty table because I've told MySQL this field must map to this other table's field. So those are the things you should be thinking about. Labs tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. We will see you next time.